Hello and welcome to the bookshelf at the Institute of South Asian Studies, Singapore, where we look at books pertinent to South Asia. My name is Nitya Subramanian and I am an editor at the Institute. Today, we will be discussing the book titled India's China Challenge, A Journey Through China's Rise and What It Means for India. While this book tells the story of a complex political relationship between two powerful neighbors, it also offers a first-hand account of the author's experiences of China. It also comes at an opportune time when there is a standoff between India and China due to clashes in Eastern Ladakh, further complicating ties. To talk to us about his book and many other recent developments, we have with us Mr. Anand Krishnan, China correspondent of The Hindu and author of this book. Anand has spent over a decade reporting from the country. Thank you for joining us today, Anand. Thank you so much for having me, Nitya. Yeah. Right at the outset, I'd like to ask you, you know, you mentioned in your book that you were not very keen on writing about writing this book. So what prompted the change in mind and why did you eventually write it? I think it was more that uh, when I first moved back uh, to India in August 2018, I'd spent almost 10 years in China by that time. I think that it was a case of being so overwhelmed by all the things that I experienced and came to learn uh, that sometimes you feel like you don't know, uh, it's difficult to find a, a, a simple argument to try and capture everything as books are sometimes required to do. So I think that was my biggest reluctance. But I also mentioned I kind of overcame it because I felt that I had something to say. The, the longer I was back home, I, I felt that uh, there was so little attention being paid to China, which is surprising, uh, given the importance of the relationship. Uh, and the questions that I got from people uh, in a day-to-day -day kind of sense were in some sense so basic about uh, how things were in China. And I also felt a lot of curiosity at the same time. So while there was a lack of information, there still was a lot of curiosity. So I felt that, you know, I should uh, try and do my best. Uh, and I think the, the biggest sort of mental hurdle that I had to overcome, even this is the first book I've written, was to tell myself that, you know, there's no perfect book. So if you get it wrong, you can always uh, try and fix it later. So I think I, once I sort of made that mental adjustment, it was, I, try, I thought I would attempt it. But you also are fluent in Mandarin. So did you go to China and learn Mandarin? How did that kind of happen? So I first went in uh, 2008 to learn Mandarin for a few months, and then uh, it ended up uh, becoming a much longer stint. So I have been learning for all these years. Uh, so speaking for me is quite fine, and I was able to uh, quite easily converse with people, though my uh, reading, as always, uh, is a work in progress. And writing as well is, is possible. Uh, I think, as is the case with many young Chinese, actually, I'm fine writing on a keyboard, but you give me a pencil and a piece of paper and I will struggle to produce the characters. Uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, for me, I think the language has been really important in trying to open up the place and people have a comfort level in speaking to you. So I think many times first time visitors, especially from India, make the mistake in thinking that people in China may be are distant or don't want to open up, but actually a lot of that is the linguistic reasons. It's not that I think people are tremendously warm to people from India. It's more that I think it's sometimes there's a shyness and conversing in English. So I think for a reporter, especially, it's, it's quite important to get beyond that barrier. Yes. So now um, let's come back to some more serious subjects. Um, so it's a well-known fact that both media and uh, the historical narratives are closely controlled in China. But there's a sense that things have become a lot more controlled in the recent past. How much of a change has been there over the last decade that you spent in China? It's quite interesting that when I first moved there in 2008, uh, right before the Olympics uh, that were happening in Beijing, I was actually quite taken aback that it was more open than I thought it would be. Um, I felt that there were at that time, there were a lot of people uh, who were willing to speak to journalists. Uh, that Around the time of the Olympics, there was a sense of China opening up to the world. And the Olympics obviously was this huge landmark coming out event. Um, and I found that uh, there were that very same year, there were new uh, laws passed that made it somewhat easier for foreign journalists to travel within China uh, across provinces uh, without really requiring permissions, except for Tibet. Uh, the domestic media was opening up. You're getting new outlets that were 
uh, obviously everything was party control, but there were varying degrees of control, which sometimes people often don't realize. And there were a lot of mag uh, magazines, independent magazines, somewhat independent magazines coming up, pushing the boundaries and the kind of reporting they were doing, investigative stories. So really it was a time when it was great to be in China as a journalist. Uh, Weibo, the microblog had launched in 2009 mm -hmm. and heading into the leadership change in 2012, it genuinely felt to me at the time and to many others that China was on this path of opening up. No one really had the expectation that it was going to become like a multi-party system or anything of that sort. Uh, but people did feel that within the one-party system that there was a trend towards some limited liberalization. But as I mentioned in the book, I think uh, 2012, 2013 and the change in leadership really turned out to be a very pivotal transformational moment. And I think that it's very clear that in the eight years since, a lot of those... Uh, things that I felt of opening up when I first went there, a lot of that's now gone. And in fact, it's receding. And the pockets of freedom you had, whether in selected media or universities, all of that I think is now uh, really, it's becoming much more controlled than it was when I first arrived in China. So now coming to President Xi Jinping, what do you think of his leadership style and his expansionist strategy of dominating the world today? So I think uh, Xi Jinping obviously is a big uh, focus of attention in the book, uh, even though the book is sort of split into different parts. I look at the first part looks at the political aspect and obviously the rise of Xi Jinping is a huge aspect of the political landscape of China in the last 10 years. And, but of course, he's also uh, a central figure in the, in the third part of the book, which is on diplomacy, because he's made such a huge imprint into how... China's diplomacy works. He has uh, made a huge change in uh, how I think China is willing to look at the whole idea of global leadership, uh, not really supplanting the United States, which, uh, but I think more in terms of being more outspoken about China's interests uh, and uh, about increasing China's voice and how things are run. And I do have one chapter on the book on the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, of course, Xi Jinping's signature project. And I think it's a great case study in Xi Jinping's kind of diplomacy uh, in how he looks at uh, China's place in the world. But I think it's also very interesting that the central theme of his leadership over the last uh, seven, eight years has been what he calls the China dream. Uh, and the China dream is basically the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation is the phrase that uh, he has really come up with to capture this China dream. And that has two important connotations, both at home and abroad. I think at home, obviously, uh, the message is that uh, he and the party leadership are trying to say that uh, they are pushing for a better uh, quality of life for people in China, whether that is uh, through this anti-corruption campaign that was the single biggest thing that he did in his first term or even in things like battling against pollution. But abroad, for all of us following China, it has a lot of important connotations. And I think it does, uh, to some extent, signify a little bit of a nationalist turn as well. Because what does rejuvenation of China mean? It means that uh, they think that the party uh, leadership is, uh, is incumbent uh, to, have, to ensure China has a greater say in world affairs, uh, that China most strongly backs for its own interests. And I think that that is manifesting if you look at China's periphery, not just on the boundary with India, where we're dealing with this huge crisis, but even with uh, China-Taiwan relations, I think even with uh, the way China handles maritime disputes, there is a big change, I think, uh, in the last few years under Xi Jinping. And I think that's something tied to what he's doing domestically. Uh, and it has, I think, very important external manifestations as well. Yes. So now moving on to India-China relationship, which is currently going through a crisis period after three years of normalization. So do you think Delhi and Beijing are doomed to be adversaries or is there any room for reconciliation? You know, I don't think they're doomed to be adversaries and I certainly hope not, but I think that, um, I don't think it's inevitable at all that, you know, that they can coexist. I think both sides have to really have the willingness at the highest levels that they need to live with each other. And I think that uh, the external affairs minister, Jai Shankar, puts it well in his own book that just came out where he talks about 
both countries trying to find an equilibrium and i think that really is a really good way to think about it because it's a very realistic way to think about it it's not to say that sometimes i think the expectations in in writings in the media or academia veer to two extremes some people say that you know india and china this whole uh, this idea that uh, the, sh- the relationship is all rosy or should be rosy uh, and uh, they can be partners on the other end of the spectrum you have the argument that they are uh, doomed to be conflictual but i think that there's a lot of middle ground in between uh, and i think that the most realistic prospect for both is to find a way to live with each other i thought that that was why as you said you had these three years of normalization from the doklam crisis in 2017 in 2018 and 2019 i was actually covered it um, the wuhan summit in 2018 when i was in wuhan Uh, and the 2019 chennai summit when i was back in india it did seem to me that both sides were investing a lot of effort and energy and capital to fix the relationship and actually to search for this equilibrium but it's still pu- somewhat puzzling to me why this whole process has been undone by the chinese military's moves on the boundary starting in may i think that uh, whether or not they were driven by tactical compulsions or other compulsions they really undone this huge two year effort to fix the relationship which i think is extremely unfortunate that's true and uh, you know talking more about the border crisis and the clash at galwan uh, do you think it has hit a stalemate and what according to you were the reasons for these incursions and do you see any kind of resolution what kind of resolution do you see going forward that is a a, a tough question because i think we're still in the middle of this process Uh, so uh, we've had seven rounds of talks between the co-commanders. Uh, the eighth round is set to happen uh, this week. Uh, that you and I are speaking in the end of October, uh, and by all accounts, it seems to be a stalemate. Where, uh, from what we gather, both sides are negotiating how they can disengage from these forward positions that they are present in along the line of actual control. And now it seems to be a question of the Chinese saying that India has to disengage first. uh but india is saying that that's impossible since it was the tla that actually changed the status quo early april so it has to be china that has to ensure that we return to where we were i find it difficult to imagine china withdrawing from the four or five different areas where they have uh, made incursions because the question would be then why did they do this in the first place so the so whether or not they can find some meeting ground where china withdraws from most of the points uh, remains to be seen but i think there are possibly three possible ways this can go one is uh, the talks find a way for both to agree on a disengagement plan uh, which i think is still challenging uh, the other possibility is that it can be as we are now where both remain deployed in large numbers throughout the very harsh winter i think both sides seem to be preparing for this outcome in terms of the winter stocking that they are doing i think the worst case and third scenario could be a repeat of what happened in galwan valley where because you have so many troops in close proximity there can be an unintended clash that leads to a loss of life again so i think that's a scenario nobody really wants so one hopes that they can find some way to disengage and why they did it quite honestly i really don't know i don't know whether it is uh, something internally in china that led them to take this decision to unilaterally push up to their version of the line of actual control uh, i don't know whether it was Uh, something about the pandemic or internal issues in china i genuinely don't know there's been so much speculation in india about why they did it but i always think that's less important than what they are doing and the, the outcomes are much more important in finding a way to deal with them yeah um your book also provides a lot of insights into the business and economic ties between india and china you know you talk about kanjivaram uh, china made kanjivaram sarees and rajasthani handicrafts to high end manufacturing and power telecom and pharmaceutical sectors so how realistic or feasible is the recent modi initiative to reduce india's reliance on china i think that uh, if we look at our dependencies on china uh, i think that the government of india is certainly aware that they can't end this reliance overnight uh, so i think some of the things that they have done uh make sense from the point of view of sending a message to china without incurring costs at home such as banning these 100 plus apps which will uh which have obviously hurt chinese companies but really don't uh, affect india all that much it's harder when you have uh, things like our imports of active pharmaceutical ingredients uh 
or big electrical machinery and equipment that we get from China, which if we source from elsewhere, is going to cost a lot more. Uh, perhaps the government of India will come to the conclusion that we have to pay this extra cost. But then all of this is under the backdrop of India going through a terrible economic uh, crisis at this moment. Yes. So it's very uh, difficult uh, decisions that need to be made. I think that it's going to be a gradual and phased process. You will see things like what we have seen so far, where you make it harder for Chinese companies to come to the India market, such as uh, TikTok or other apps. You make it harder for Chinese companies to acquire stakes in Indian companies by tightening FDI procedure that has already happened. I think these things you can do. What will be harder is this structural import reliance that you have on a number of key goods. I think that can only happen if India has a long-term plan in self-sufficiency. We've been talking about it a lot for many years, but so far it hasn't happened. So whether or not ultimately India can uh, move away in a big way is contingent on whether we get our own act together at home. So until that happens, I think uh, the rest of it won't really follow. Um, another interesting uh, development during the last few years has been a growing people-to-people -people engagement between India and China. We see a lot more Indians visiting China and vice versa. So will the deepening popular contact now be reversed because of this current crisis between the two countries? I think yes and no in the sense that um, I think that obviously we've had a huge flood of Chinese investors, business people coming to India over the last few years. Obviously, the pandemic has meant that there's a huge halt in exchanges anyway. But I think it's possible that if, these, uh, if the current crisis continues, there will certainly be, I think, a decline in uh, trade and investment relations and that kind of engagement. I think that uh, so far, uh, one of the huge uh, sort of uh, paths of engagement has been Indian students in China. I think there are more than 25,000 Indian students, most of whom study medicine in China. I think that uh, because of the fact that there aren't that many alternatives, why they're going to China in the first place is because it's so difficult to get seats in India. So I think mm -hmm. um, the Chinese universities are obviously welcome to have them since it's a huge sort of money-making enterprise for the Chinese universities. I think those kind of uh, avenues will continue uh, since in this case, it benefits both. Uh, I think uh, tourism in any case, quite frankly, uh, Chinese outbound tourism to India is among the least of anywhere in Asia. It was increasing quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, and I think that uh, in this pandemic situation, of course, everything is now an uncertainty. But if looking beyond the pandemic four or five years down the line, I think I would see those areas of cultural engagement continuing. Uh, even if India is perhaps wary about some things, like recently there's been a move to more strictly look at what Chinese universities are doing vis-a-vis -vis their relationships with Indian universities. Now, I think those avenues will perhaps be regulated more strictly by India. So I'd say it's a mixed picture. Uh, and obviously, a lot of it is also going to uh, depend not only on uh, India's own emergence from the pandemic, but also on where this boundary crisis goes. Is it going to uh, be settled in a way that allows some amount of going back to where things were? Though I personally believe that relationship is going to find it very difficult to go back completely to this uh, good phase of 2018, 2019. I think the boundary crisis has been so serious and has, has raised so many fundamental questions about the broader relationship that I think there isn't going to be a going back. Um, also, a rising China has become a force to reckon with in the subcontinent and in the Indian Ocean. Do you see the Indian elite prepared to deal with this long-term challenge? I think that uh, there is a sense that over the last 10 years uh, that China has become a factor in South Asia. It's a reality. I don't think, I think the public opinion, I would say, has evolved from this notion that, you know, this South Asia was India's uh, quote unquote backyard uh, and uh, no one else had a right to be there. I think that anyway, I don't think there was a view that was viewed uh, all that favorably in India's own neighborhood. So I think there has been an evolution of that among policymakers and opinion makers as well, that India has to have a different approach to the neighborhood where you treat your neighbors on an equal footing uh, in many ways, that you, are, you try and uh, you impose your own views and demands on their domestic politics much less. Uh, you deal with whoever is in charge in these countries. I think there is a lot of correction happening to India's neighborhood diplomacy. 
from what we saw in the past that led to quite a bit of problems. So I think the correction is happening. And I think that, frankly, given that China is the world's second largest economy, I think their economic presence in the neighborhood is a fact of life. And it's not necessarily entirely a bad thing. Uh, obviously, I think India is concerned about some aspects of, um, for example, some of the Chinese projects that have uh, led to debt burdens on countries. That's something that India has been quite outspoken about. But I think Sri Lanka is an interesting example where you've had such you've had two big changes in leadership and now you're back to where you were. And at the end of it, through all of these political changes in Sri Lanka, I think that one thing that you kept hearing from their own officials was where else do we go for money? It's that uh, it's not that they have so many sources of funding that they can go to. But I think that it's come to a situation where I think people are quite pragmatic about it and those expectations that this is your own backyard. I think those have really evolved. Yes, and um, it, we, we can't help, I mean, we must ask you about China's internal developments. A lot is happening there as well, for, for example, in Tibet and in Xinjiang, which are both in the limelight today. So has China's approach to the minorities changed radically under Xi Jinping? You know, in the case of Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, there have been huge changes, but I kind of, in the book, I try and pinpoint when all of these changes began. And I think in many ways, some of it was, uh, was predating Xi Jinping's ascension. I think in the case of Tibet and Xinjiang, you had these two big developments in 2008 and 2009, and Tibet in 2008 and Xinjiang in 2009, when you had the Urumqi riots. And I think that uh, as far as Xinjiang is concerned, the Urumqi riots in 20, uh, 2009, and then the attack on Kunming railway station in 2014, as I outline in the chapter on Xinjiang in the book, were really two significant events in leading to what I uh, see as a huge securitization of their approach to Xinjiang. I think the broader commonality is that there is a rethink, I think, on minority policy. And, there, and I think people in China who believed that this uh, recognizing 55 minorities, having these minority autonomous regions, I think the hardline views that believe that these policies were engendering a kind of, uh, you know, minority identity that was superseding the national identity and that had to be corrected. I think uh, this imposition of a national identity as a priority is something that is really uh, playing out in Tibet, Xinjiang and Hong Kong as well in a very different way. Um, and I think that these changes have obviously accelerated under Xi Jinping. And uh, I don't think there's going back to that. I think, uh, especially with Xinjiang, uh, with, the, uh, with this whole so-called vocational training as the government puts it. Uh, when I traveled through Xinjiang in 2010 and 11 and uh, 12, which I, and I write about these three trips uh, in some detail in the book, I would never have believed it if you told me that you'd end up in the situation of a million people or so, uh, you know, uh, in these internment camps. It's something that's unbelievable in, the, in this century, in this day and age. But yet I think it's the, uh, that's where policy has ended up and it's been driven by this whole approach that's predicated on securitization more than anything else. Yes, and finally on the external front, there is a dramatic expansion of China's international footprint. What are your reflections on the consequences of a global China for India? I think that one of the interesting trends in the Indian India-China relationship has been that even though you had bilateral problems, I think for uh, post the normalization of 1988, throughout the 90s and 2000s, there actually were a lot of shared global interests. Uh, I, and I think in addition to trade, the fact that they had a lot of shared global interests in having multipolarity, a greater share of uh, say for uh, developing countries and how uh, international institutions are run. I think all of that was very important, working together on trade and climate change. It was a big driver and a positive driver of the relationship for the last 20 plus years. But I think in the book, I try and ex uh, argue that because China's own global worldview is changing so dramatically under Xi, it's really calling into question uh, the shared global interests of India and China, which I think are becoming more conflictual now and less cooperative. And that's also obviously because I think it's clear that China now sees itself in a, in a group of two with uh, America. Um, in the book, I look back at a hundred years of this, uh, this trend in Chinese thought that kind of resents this notion of parity between India and China that we all assume and take for granted in India, yes. but they genuinely dislike this equation. So I think that uh, as China more and more comes to the center of the stage, as it likes to put it, uh, and as China obviously 
being the world's second largest economy, uh, has a much greater uh, sort of stake uh, in many, many countries around the world. It's something that India has to come to terms to deal with. And I think one interesting consequence of the relationship is going to be that one pillar that worked really well in having shared global interests, to me, that's, that's really weakening. So it adds, I think, to this balance, uh, which, uh, which has been a balance of, of cooperating on some things, competing in some things. I think to my eyes, this balance has been really tilting towards a greater uh, confrontation and uh, greater a conflictual relationship, which is concerning. But it seems to me that that seems to be the direction in which things are moving. Thank you so much, Anand. It was a wonderful conversation with you. And I hope you can get back to China soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.